Well, it is good to be with all of you. If we haven't had the opportunity to meet yet, my name is Sterling. Uh, Most uh, weekends, I am over at our Mill Creek campus. I'm the campus pastor over there. Uh, But every once in a while, um, it's good to to come over and be with all of you and and reconnect with some people that I hadn't seen in a while and meet some new people. And we're so grateful that you are here this morning. Um, in, In the summer of 1859, there was a French acrobat who went by the stage name of the Great Blondine. Uh, it was his uh, full blonde hair that kind of was his hallmark. And he was famous, uh, particularly kind of in upstate New York, for his act of walking across the Niagara Falls on a tightrope. Um, and and p- huge crowds started to gather to see this death-defying act. And as any act like that is once it's been done, right, you kind of have to up the ante. And so the great Blondine would make his act incre- uh, increasingly difficult. Uh, one time he walked across the tightrope on stilts, for instance. Another time he rode a bicycle all, all the way across the tightrope. Uh, yet another time he carried a small pot belly stove out to the middle of the Niagara Falls on a tightrope and made an omelet and ate it and then finished crossing over. Uh, July that year of 1859, his particular version of his act uh, that weekend was to cross the tightrope while pushing a wheelbarrow. And so this is actually a poster from the Buffalo News where it was advertising this death-defying act, where you could come see if, I don't know if you can see it there, but he is a master funabulist, um, which I had to Google that, but turns out that just means tightrope walker. I thought it was like a doctor or something, but, um, and, and he, he was advertising that he was gonna cross while pushing a wheelbarrow. And of course, he successfully accomplishes the, tax, uh, the task, he gets to the other side, and to just huge cheers from the crowd who are watching him do the seemingly impossible task. And, and as the crowd is cheering, he asked them the question, do you believe that I could place somebody in this wheelbarrow and cross over? And they all begin to cheer. And, and even say like, we believe, we believe like he's riling up the crowd, right? He's getting them going. And then he says, can I get a volunteer? And the crowd goes quiet. And there's silence. Right? Because it's, it's one thing to ascribe belief to someone, to say, we believe you can do this. It's quite another to trust your entire life to it. We understand, I think somewhat intuitively, the correlation that exists between what we believe, or at least what we say we believe, and how we live. In fact, some of you have probably experienced Something like uh, a loved one, a, a friend or a coworker who has some transformative moment. Maybe it's a, a health scare, right? And, and they're like, I am going to eat different. I'm going to live different. I'm gonna start exercising. And if you have been down that road with them before, right? If there's any part of that um, kind of skeptical side that, that wells up for you in that, like. Your response is oftentimes, my response is oftentimes like, prove it. Kind of in the back of my head, I'm thinking, I'll I'll believe it when when I see it. On On the flip side of this same narrative, this same expectation is the is the correlation between action and what we say we believe is used as kind of one of the the critiques, if you will, that is oftentimes levied at Christians or at the church, meaning that, and sometimes it's the the accusation of hypocrisy, meaning sometimes people look at a gathering such as this and, and they question whether or not we practice what we preach. Or is this all just talk? If we're honest with ourselves, Sometimes it's fair, right? Certainly been moments when we have not lived up to the way of Jesus. I will be the first to, to acknowledge that, confess that. Sometimes it's, it's not fair, but either way, 
We understand the correlation, the connection to the relationship between what we say we believe and how that ought to reveal itself in in the lives that we live. James uh, wrote in his letter to really what is the first church in Jerusalem, the early, some of the very earliest Christians. As he writes his letter to the church, he is confronting, as, as James is um, uniquely equipped to do, he's, he's confronting this version of quote unquote faith that he sees among some that attempts to separate what they ascribe and and say they believe about Jesus, what Jesus has taught as it relates to his royal law, if you remember talking about that last week, love our neighbors as ourselves, separate that from an actual physical responsibility to care for the poor and the marginalized. And to this, James somewhat famously, and, and, and in the view of others, maybe somewhat infamously, says that faith without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. If you have your Bibles, let's turn to James chapter two. I'll pray for us and then we'll, we'll read this passage together. Father, as we come into your word, would you illuminate it? Would your Holy Spirit again continue to teach us what you intend to communicate that we might be transformed to be men and women and students who more closely represent you. We ask all these things in your name, amen. James chapter two, flip over there with me. We're gonna pick things up in verse 14 and we're gonna read through the end of the chapter and then we're gonna talk a bit about this. This is what James writes. He says, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, If someone claims to have faith, but does not have works, can such a faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothes and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, stay warm and be well fed, but you don't give them what the body needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith, if it doesn't have works, is dead by itself. But someone will say, you have faith and and I have works. Show me your faith without works, and I will show you faith by my works. You believe that God is one, good. Even the demons believe and shudder. Senseless person. Are you willing to learn that faith without works is useless? Wasn't Abraham our father justified by works in offering Isaac his son on the altar? You see that faith was active together with his works, and by works, faith was made complete And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. In the same way, wasn't Rahab the prostitute also justified by works in receiving the the messengers and sending them out by a different route? For just as the body without the spirit is dead, So also faith without works is dead. Okay, just one more time there. Here, verse 24 again. You see, a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Like, does that bother anybody? Raise any red flags? We have to look at what James is communicating to the church Right? It's that we don't misinterpret or misapply James's correlation between how we live our lives, how that is put on display, and the faith that it is intended to reveal. So let's begin by, by looking at what James says about faith without works. Let's start there, faith without works. And, and part of this conversation in this passage, one of the challenges of it is we, we have to make sure that we're understanding his his terms correctly. When I was a student ministry pastor uh, for, for 20 years or so, I would oftentimes take our, our students on a, a variety of different mission trips, several of which, like the short-term trips that, that students go on in the summer, you heard about that recently with some of our students returning from Ecuador. And, and oftentimes, um, I, I foolishly, I took French in high school. Apologies if there's a French teacher in here. Um, 
but I didn't learn Spanish. And so what I did learn, I learned kind of by cultural immersion on these trips and picked up a few phrases. Um, and, and one of the time when we were making concrete in Ecuador, I was in charge of working the concrete mixer. I was sort of being supervised by some of the um, staff there at El Refugio and, and learning some of the lingo. And they would kind of look at the concrete in the mixer and determine if it was ready to be poured. And sometimes if, if it wasn't ready, they would point to these stones, if they needed more stones, and say, sopas, sopas. So I took that to mean that the name of like a small stone in Spanish was, was sopas. Uh, but that's soupy uh, or soup, right? And so in a context other than that, in situations with students and stuff like that, I would, I would point to something and use that word. And they're like, what are you talking about, right? And, and, and that's a little bit like we, when we dive into this, we have to really understand what, what James is referring to with his terms here. See, one of the reasons that we, and, and not just us, Martin Luther, famously the 16th century reformer, uh, German monk, he, he had some issues with James. Right? One of the reasons we can read this section of James and say, hang on a second. And there, like a, a check in our spirit is because it appears when we look at it to be in conflict with how we understand and teach the gospel here at Chapel Street. If you have been here for even just a short time, I feel confident in saying that you've heard Pastor Jeff or you've heard some of the other preaching pastors say that at the very core of our faith, what we believe about God and what, what we teach about him is that, that salvation that he provides to us is a gift that comes to us through faith and, and by grace, it's, it's a gift. It's given to us. We don't add anything to it. Full stop. It, it, this salvation that we talk about, it is entirely accomplished by Jesus. And so we don't buy it as, as, as Martin Luther was confronting in indulgences. We, we don't uh, work for it. We don't earn it. It is given to us by grace and it is received through faith. The apostle Paul in his letter to the Ephesian church. He describes this so eloquently and profoundly in chapter two of that book. He says, for you are saved by grace through faith. It is not of yourselves. It is God's gift, not from works so that no one can boast. So how do I reconcile what Paul says in Ephesians with what James writes in verse 24 when he says, you see a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Do, do, do Paul and James, are they preaching a different conflicting versions of the gospel? And it's a fair question. And again, we have to look at, at kind of the flow of what James is saying here. One of the things that we need to consider in this is, is what has immediately preceded this section in, in James's letter. Right, in the English translations, we have this tendency, and if your Bible's anything like mine, like the beginning of chapter two starts with a header and then verse 14 has a separate header. And so our tendency is to kind of disassociate these. These are a new idea that James is talking about here. And, and that is, is not fully accurate. Those are, I'm, not, I'm not saying that's a problem. What I'm saying is that when you read this, if you were to take away the verse numbers and, and the chapter headers, Right? You would understand it, it flows more intuitively into the thought that James is going in here as it relates between our faith and our works. And here's what James is pointing out. He's still talking about the sin of favoritism. He's still talking about this, this violation of the royal law where, where he perceives that within the church, there is those who, who are coming in and need and, and in their midst, there are some who have somehow separated Right, this need that they're experiencing and, and the vision of Jesus that calls us to respond. And, and he's saying, hang on a second, guys. It's also important to understand that James and Paul are writing to two different audiences. Paul's letters are almost entirely written in the mind of, of the Gentile or somebody that did not grow up uh, understanding the Torah or, or Jewish traditions, any of that. 
And their temptation frequently was when, when Paul preached the gospel was almost kind of that this is too good to be true reaction. So Paul's constantly fighting this temptation in his letters where there's this felt need amongst those who have received the gospel to start adding something to it, specifically Old Testament law. So sometimes it was Jesus and obedience to the Torah, Jesus and circumcision, or Jesus and eating kosher, whatever it looked like. And James is constantly reminding them to, their idea, right, of being in, in the kingdom of God, in this community that Jesus has got together. I, I have to add these things, and, and Paul's constantly pushing against that. Where James, on the other hand, he is writing to a primarily Jewish audience. And to this audience, and I'm quoting from um, John Dixon's actually wrote a commentary on on James, and he says this. He says, suppose, he's, the audience says that suppose that justification comes on the basis of mere mental assent to God and his Messiah, and that devotion to the Messiah's royal law of love is an optional extra, like something that you would add on. And to that, James says that, that faith, that is no faith at all. That is not a transformative faith. Jesus here, so he's, he's, James is is contrasting what we would think of or, or talk about as biblical faith, grace-based faith that is transformative in our life and a version of faith or faith that is mere mental assent that really has no bearing or no commitment tied into the royal law or to the king who gave it to us. And this faith, according to James, this faith that is alone apart from works, doesn't justify because this faith that is alone is not a, an active faith. It's a thought, it's an idea, it's a belief that you have that does not impact or transform the way that you live. And again, James, by the way, is not teaching us that this is gonna, that we need to be perfect. James is not teaching us that, that, that we never fail, that we don't see situations and not respond according to the way of Jesus. In fact, in chapter one, if you remember when he's talking about trials, he, he highlights this need to endure because endurance in us is going to produce maturity. It's going to the sense of completeness where, and we lack nothing. So he, James recognizes we are still on a trajectory in our journey with Jesus. This is an ongoing work. So perhaps this is helpful, uh, like sometimes I, I think pastors, we can, get, we can be guilty of using a lot of sports illustrations. So I'm trying to appeal to uh, the mathletes out there today. So this is what James is not saying. Think of it like this. Like if we think of faith being, works being added to it, that then produces salvation. That throughout the gospels, that notion is, is completely and entirely Defeated. It's not, that is not the gospel. And James is not suggesting that it is the gospel. However, I think he is offering us an if then logic. He's saying if faith, if, if we have placed our faith in Jesus, then we are saved. We have salvation. And he's saying then if we are saved, if that is the result of our faith in Jesus, right, that is going to reveal itself in, in the way that we live and the works that we produce. So for the 12 of you out here that are into math, um, you're welcome. And by the way, Paul agrees with James. Because when we go back and we look at that Ephesians passage in, in uh, Ephesians chapter two, in verse 10, he follows up that and he says this. He says, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared ahead of time for us to do. James, that if then statement, that logic, Paul says, yes, I, I'm right there with you. James continues now and, and he takes on kind of another version of this, which is this version that says, well, you have faith and, and I have works. You have faith, I have works. Like we just need to think about this a little bit more holistically. Let's think about this as, as, a, as a corporate body. And again, James is saying, hang on a second. Like, I, I, he doesn't want us to kind of miss the big picture here. Look at verse, verses uh, 18 again of James chapter two. Here kind of this 
idea gets presented, he says, but someone will say, you have faith and I, I have works. Show me your faith without works and I will show you faith by my works. You believe that God is one. So here he quotes the Shema from, from Deuteronomy, a, a phrase that um, faithful Jewish men and women would have quoted every single day of their lives. He said, you believe this. Okay, great, good. He said, even the demons believe and they shudder. In other words, that's not where faith ends. Senseless person, you are willing, are you willing to learn that faith without works is useless. When I was a kid uh, growing up in a small rural town in, in, um, in the western part of Ohio, at the back of our yard, there was this concrete pad. And on that concrete pad, my dad had parked uh, his Saab 1960, like something, Saab 96. Um, in fact, I got a picture of, um, that's not my mom. I don't know. I don't <laughs> I don't know who that is, but, um, but the car, the sob that sat out in the back of our, our lot, never in my entire experience, I never experienced it like this. It was rusted out. The, all four tires had dry rot and were completely flat. And so I experienced that car as a fort that I would hide behind in snowball fights with my brothers. I experienced it as a jungle gym that we would climb on over and over again. I experienced it as a pretend spaceship on a missions to Mars. But I, as, as it relates to its ability to fulfill the purpose of a car, I never saw it. It never moved from, from that spot. It sat there and it was, by that definition, it was useless and it was dead. And this is how James confronts this idea of, of a faith apart from works. Look again at what he says here in, in, in verse 20. Senseless person, are you willing to learn that faith without works is, is useless? In verse 14, at the very outset, he asks the question, what good is it? What good is it, brothers and sisters? If you claim to have faith, but you have no works... Wait, what, what, what use does that accomplish? We have to remember that James here, he has been heavily influenced by his brother, older brother, Jesus. His Sermon on the Mount, the, the, the vision that Jesus taught of his kingdom and what, what it would look like. If you remember that back in, in Matthew or in Luke where Jesus is describing his kingdom, he's constantly contrasting the kingdom of this world, how this world operates, and the kingdom that he was initiating, that he was ushering in. And James says, how does a faith that says, I see the need, I'm aware of it, but I don't feel that, that my faith in Jesus compels me to be a part of it. How does that, how do we reconcile that with the, the kingdom that Jesus taught? A kingdom that Jesus described as, as caring for the sick. A, a, a kingdom that Jesus described where, where the poor would be provided for, where brokenness is restored. How does that version of faith, right, advance this kingdom? To that point, to that end, James says, it's useless. And he gives us this, this supposed uh, or this hypothetical situation in verses 15 and 16. He says, Ima imagine for a moment that somebody walked into our space, they're, they're half naked and they're nearly starving. We see the person, we respond to them and, and, and we walk up to them and, and we even wish them well, right? Like thoughts and prayers and, and we hope everything works out and best of luck, we are rooting for you, right? And we do nothing, no, no clothes are provided to them, no food is given to them. James is saying, how can we reconcile that with the kingdom that Jesus taught? How can we look at that and say, this fulfills the royal law that was given to us by our king, love our neighbor as ourself? He said that, that version of faith, that is little more, nothing more than mental assent to ascribing to an idea. And he said, that, that's, the demons are there. The demons will look and recognize that he's God, and they shudder. 
But not only is it useless, he goes on to say that it's, it's ultimately, it's just dead. It's a dead faith. Look again at, at verse 26. For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. Verse 17, he says the same thing. In the same way, if, it doesn't have, if faith doesn't have works, it's dead by itself. And I, I really, I think James, oftentimes when we read James, we have that like sense in us, of like, man, he can be kind of blunt sometimes, right? But I, I, his heart here is pastoral for the church, right? J, he, he understands, James understands that it's by faith that we trust God. It is by faith that we obey God. And as followers of Jesus, this is the very definition of what it means to be alive. When Jesus said, I've come that you may have life and have it to the full, this is what he envisioned for his people, that we would follow him, trust him, and obey him, and that this would be the place where we are, in fact, most alive. Dead faith, a faith that doesn't produce the type of trust that leads to action. James' concern is that this is no faith at all. It's no faith at all. And, and, and as I was preparing this week and, and looking at this passage and thinking through James's passion in this, there's a part of me that was like, is this, was this unique to what was unfolding in his time? Is, is James addressing something that while true then is, is, and I was reminded again of stories of friends that I know, people who grew up in the church. And they said, I was, I was there. I heard it every week. I, I sang the songs. I knew the language. I did the things. And now from a perspective of having a transformative with Jesus, uh, encounter with Jesus, they're looking at that season of their life and they're saying, I, was, I had mental assent that it is possible to sit here week after week after week, nod and approve and just ascribe to the idea and never trust our lives to Jesus. And James loves the church too much to leave them there. He loves them too much. And so with passion and purpose, he said, that's a dead faith because it hasn't transformed you. And then he leaves us these, these two examples. This is faith displayed by works. It's faith displayed by works. Look at how he concludes this, this together. In verse 20, which we just read, he says, senseless person, are you willing to learn that faith without works is useless? Wasn't Abraham our father justified by works in offering Isaac his son on the altar? You see, that, you, you see that faith was active together with his works and by works, faith was made complete. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. In the same way, wasn't Rahab the prostitute also justified by works in receiving the messengers and sending them out by a different route? For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. James cites these two examples. On the one hand, we have Abraham, who is the father of Judaism, the hero of the faith. On the other hand, you have a, a Gentile prostitute who's living in Jericho. And he says, these two people model to us what faith that reveals itself in, in the way we live, the choices that we make, the actions that we take. This is what it looks like. James here quotes from Genesis chapter 15, where it's Genesis, or Abraham is described there as, as believing in God and having it credited to him as, as righteousness. And then he essentially is asking the question, how do we know? How do we know that Abraham believed God? How do we know that he put his faith in him? Because when God asked Abraham to lay down his only connection to the covenant promise that, that he had made with him, that God had made with Abraham, when God asked him to lay his son on the altar, Abraham trusted him and he did it. How do we know that Rahab saw what God had done for the Israelites and said, that is the one true God? We know because when 
Joshua sent spies into Jericho to, to scope out the land, right? When they were being pursued by the enemy, Rahab, at great personal risk to herself, she hid them and she sent them away in a different direction. It would have been much easier and, and she probably would have been rewarded to say, here they are, turn them over. How do we know that Abraham believed God? Because we could see it. How do we know that Rahab believed God? How do we know her faith was genuine? Because it was put on display, and here's the point. It's not the action that saves us. That's not what James is arguing. But it is the exercise of our faith that demonstrates a transformative trust in the God who saves. James loves the church too much to let us sit in a faith that is nothing more than mental assent. He's saying that does not, that doesn't justify us. I told you the story at, at the outset of the great Blondine, who after he had crossed over the uh, Niagara Falls and, and to the roars of the crowd and asked the question, do you think I can push a person in this wheelbarrow across on the tightrope? Everybody gets completely silent. And, and after a few moments, one person stepped up and said, I believe. I think you can do it. That person actually was his manager. He had seen Blondine do it a hundred times. He had seen him walk across. And he trusted that he could do it again, even with his own life at stake. See, Jesus calls the church to know believe and to live the gospel, the transformative gospel. And he wants the truth that we hold to in our hearts and our minds to be on display in our lives. We don't act, we don't work to be saved. We do so because we are. And that's Jesus and, or James's instruction to the church. And so if you're, if you're here this morning, I think there are gonna be two categories, right? Well, there, I'm, there's way more than two, but let's just for two today. And, and you fight that temptation that, that maybe Paul was confronting where it's always like this sense of it just being Jesus can't, that can't be enough. And there's, I've always got to add something to my life, right? That is a, a, that is a false gospel. And that's not what James is teaching. It's not what Paul's teaching. It's not anywhere in scripture. If you're here this morning and you're like, I can, not along, I can sing the song, I can, I can say the words. And it has never moved beyond a, a mental ascent for you, that is a false gospel. And James says, I love the church too much, trust him with your entire life. Right? Get in the wheelbarrow, if you will. Let's pray together. Jesus, we do just thank you for your word and thank you for this um, for James' passion, for his passion for the church and for a life that is transformed by Jesus. And Lord, we do, we fully and entirely rely on your grace and we approach it through faith. And so Holy Spirit, continue your work, continue to transform us so that we would be men and women and children and students who are putting on display the saving grace of God so that all may know and respond to you. And it's in your name we pray, amen. That song so powerfully encapsulates, I think, James' heart for the church, um, that we would encounter Jesus, that we would be transformed, and that it would be lived out to advance his kingdom and, and for his glory. Um, as I offer the benediction this morning, be reminded as you leave to stop and pick one of these up. Get where we are mobilizing as a church. We're being sent um, to be people of, of proximity, and um, hospitality with our neighbors as examples, pictures of the gospel. You'll get these little cards as well that you can um, give out when the kids are looking for candy that invites them to be a part of, of some things happening here as well. If we can pray with you, our uh, prayer team is in the glass room. We invite you to swing by there. And if you came prepared to give this morning, our, our offering boxes are, are by the doors as you exit. Now receive this morning's benediction. Go in the name of Jesus, whose grace has been poured out to us, who offers us salvation, life in him by faith. 
or transform us and send us to be your church. And it's in your name we pray, amen.